What's up my pre-calc people? I'm Michael Princhak and I'm ready to teach you AP pre-calculus. This is topic 1.1 over change in tandem and on paper it's actually a really small simple topic that a lot of people might just quickly brush through but there's a lot of really valuable really important information in topic 1.1 that's actually going to kind of set the stage for everything else the rest of the year. So let's without further ado dive right into the information. First, we can't talk about how functions change without first, well, talking about what a function is. So hopefully you remember from earlier classes, but a function is a mathematical relation that maps a set of input values to a set of output values. And the only one really important rule is that every single input value can have one and only one output value. Now the domain is the set of all input values, which are the independent variable. Typically that's going to be x. The range is the set of all output values for the dependent variable, and that's typically going to be y, which in this course we're going to actually call f of x. f of x and y are the same thing. Inputs x, outputs f of x. The function is a rule that tells us how that x gets moved or mapped to that new f of x value. Now there are three different ways that we could represent a function. We could do a graphical representation where we take this plane of x and y and we map our points on it and we connect the points to make a graph. You guys all know that. We also have a numerical representation of a function which is an input output table of values. And lastly we have an analytical or algebraic old representation of a function which is like the actual function itself that tells us exactly what to do with our x to transform it into our f of x. Now knowing the domain of a function is a pretty important task. Now if you're looking at a graph, that's fairly simple to do, but if you're looking at the algebraic or analytical representation of a function, that's something you definitely need to be able to do. And it can be a little bit tricky because you've got to involve algebra. So first here we have a polynomial function. Now the cool thing about a polynomial function is that it's pretty easy because the domain is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. By the way, negative to infinity to infinity is an interval and we like to give all domains of an interval from left to right. Now we're working with a function like this, a square root function, there's a really important rule you got to remember with square roots and that is that the inside value of a square root, in this case x minus 3, must be strictly greater than or equal to 0. Negative numbers can't happen inside of a square root. So that means that to find the domain we simply have to take x minus 3, set it greater than or equal to 0 and solve and we get x has to be greater than or equal to 3 which means that the domain is the interval negative 3 to infinity with a bracket on that negative 3 because we want to include it. Now for this next function we see a rational function. Now the key thing with rational functions or fractions, right, is that the denominator is not allowed to be zero. You cannot divide by zero. You can divide by positives, you can divide by negatives, you just cannot divide by zero. So any value that makes the denominator zero needs to be left out of the domain. So our denominator is x plus 5, which means that x plus 5 cannot equal zero, which means x cannot equal negative 5. So in our domain we need to include all numbers, but we have to make sure to skip over negative 5. So we're going to go from negative infinity to negative 5, then we're going to continue on from negative 5 to infinity. Parentheses on those negative fives because we cannot include them because it's going to make our denominator zero. Now when you're analyzing a function and especially how a function changes, there are four really important words that you're probably going to use a lot. Positive, negative, increasing, and decreasing. But it's how you use those four words that actually is going to matter a ton in this course. Because there's a huge difference if you're talking about how those function values are changing, positive, negative, increasing, decreasing, versus how the rate of change of your function is positive, negative, increasing, or decreasing. So let's break it all down for you right now. When you are examining function values, that's the actual output values, f of x, you can examine when they are positive. A function value is positive or a function is positive where that function f of x, the output values, is greater than zero. You can also analyze where a function values are negative. Function values are negative where f of x is less than zero. Now, if you're looking at a graph, the only other thing that a function can be besides greater than zero or less than zero is it can be zero. Now where a function equals zero is actually super important. These are called, well, x-intercepts, but they're more importantly called solutions. The solution to a function is where that function crosses the x-axis, which means it's where the function equals zero. So function values can be positive if they're greater than zero, negative if they're less than zero, or they can be equal to zero, which means they're these super important zeros if they are equal to zero. 
Now we can analyze positive and negative function values by looking at a table like this, and we see that most of the function values, f of x, are positive, but we do see one of them is zero at negative two, which means we have, well, a solution or a zero at negative two for this function. We can also look at a graphical representation of a function to determine where that function is positive, negative, or equal to zero. So here's a function here that we could take a look at, and we might say, hey, where is the function values greater than zero, meaning positive? And that's where we're looking anywhere above the x-axis that the function exists. So in this graph, we say that the function is above the x-axis, hence greater than zero, from negative four to 2.5, and then again from 5.5 to seven. So we have these two separate intervals, in each of those intervals, our output values, our f of x, our function values, are positive or greater than zero. Notice that we see a bracket on that negative four because at negative four, we definitely have a positive value. Whereas at the 2.5, we see a parenthesis because at 2.5, we're actually equal to zero, which means it's neither positive nor negative. So where are our function values negative? Well, that's gonna be anywhere from 2.5 to 5.5, and we see that the portion of that graph dips below the x-axis, hence it's negative. And then finally, we could ask you, where are the function values actually equal to zero? And of course, that's gonna be at roughly 2.5 and 5.5. So it's pretty easy to analyze a graph and determine where your function's positive or negative or equal to zero. Now, what if you wanna analyze positive or negative function values when you don't have a graph or a table, all you have is the analytical algebraical function itself? Well, actually really easy. All you have to do to figure out where your function is greater than zero, meaning positive, is just set your function greater than equal and solve. And that's it. So in this particular case, we have a quadratic. We're gonna find our critical values. They're called solutions if it's an equation. Inequality, they're critical values. We're gonna create that number line, analyzing where it happens around those critical values. We're gonna analyze values before it, which are gonna be positive, before negative four. We're gonna analyze values in between negative four and two, which are gonna end up being negative. And we're gonna analyze values after two, which are gonna up being positive. And again, since we're looking for where our function is positive, we're gonna look at those two intervals that create positive values, and that is values from negative infinity to negative four, and then two to infinity. Now, we could also analyze where this function is less than zero, so we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna simply set it less than zero, and we're gonna solve the value. So we got our critical values, negative four and two, put them on a number line, find those intervals, and again, where our function is negative is gonna be values in between negative four and two. All you gotta do is find those critical values, test the values to the left and the middle and to the right, and you'll determine where you are positive or negative, and in this case, we're negative from negative four to two. And lastly, we could find where we are equal to zero, and how do you do that algebraically? You just set your function equal to zero and solve. In this case, we have a quadratic. We could use the quadratic formula, or we could factor it, and we get our two solutions of negative four and two. Pretty simple to do. All right, now that we've talked enough about that word positive and negative, let's talk about those two words increasing and decreasing. Because you see, the function values can increase or the function values can decrease. So function values can increase when the interval is this. So when you're looking at an interval from A to B and f of A is less than f of B, the output for A is less than the output for B, you are increasing over that interval. And you can actually see here in the picture that that is happening. Since f of a is lower than f of b, as we travel from a to b, we are increasing. Our function values are getting bigger. Then we are decreasing over an interval from a to b. When f of a is greater than f of b, the output for a is greater than the output for b, and we actually see that in the graph here as well. And to travel from a to b, we have to go down, hence the function is decreasing. So once again, we can look at a graph and determine where are we increasing and where are we decreasing simply by looking at where are the output values going up versus where are the output values going down. So we take a look at this graph right here. We could say, all right, for over what intervals are or is the function increasing? And we see shaded in yellow here where we see that the function values are going up over intervals. So from negative two to zero, the function is increasing. And then from four to seven, it's increasing as well. Now, where is the function values decreasing? Well, once again, that's why I have shaded here in green. We see that the function values are actually going down from negative four to negative two, and they're going down from zero to four. Now, some people will say, wait a minute, do you need brackets or parentheses when you're talking about increasing, decreasing? A little bit of a debate in the um, pre-calculus world, but to be honest, right now what I'm telling my students is, I'll give you a credit for either parentheses or brackets, it doesn't matter right now, it's not a big deal. On a multiple choice question, they're not gonna try to trick you by using parentheses on one and in brackets on another. So it's really more important that you understand just how to find that interval, whether you use brackets or parentheses, not that big of a deal. 
The next thing we can analyze when we're talking about a function is not about what the function values are doing, whether the function values are going up or going down or positive or negative, but analyzing how the function values are changing. We call this the rate of change. What is the rate of change of a particular function? So again, we're not looking at the function values themselves, we're looking at how the function values are changing. We see in this quadratic function here that we have function values that first decrease and then they increase. All right, and that that vertex is where that change is being made. Now, how are they decreasing? How are they increasing? That's what we're doing when we're talking about the rate of change. Now, when your rate of change is positive, that is equivalent to your function values increasing. When you have a rate of change that's positive, it means, well, you're going up. And if you're going up, you're increasing. But we could also see function values that are negative, or rate of change, excuse me. Rates of change can be negative. When you have a rate of change that's negative, that is equivalent to saying that your function values are decreasing. Because if your rate of change is negative, if you're changing in a negative direction, then guess what? You're going down. So in this quadratic here, we see two lines, the blue and the green. And what I'm trying to represent by these lines is the rate of change, how we're changing at those points. And what I'm analyzing here is the slope of these lines at these points of tangency. So the tangent point is where, you know, is a specific point on the function, and we draw a tangent line that touches that function just at that point at that specific location. Now, in blue, we see that that rate of change, the slope of that line, would be negative, which is why on that side of the graph, the graph is decreasing. Makes a lot of sense. On the right side, we see the green line and the rate of change or the slope of that green line would be positive, and that is why on the right side of this graph, we are increasing. But notice that how those two functions are increasing and decreasing are very different. Well, obviously one is positive, one is negative, but also know that the rate of the change, the actual numerical value itself, is very different. The blue line is decreasing at a pretty strong rate, whereas the green line is increasing at a mediocre rate, I guess you could say. So really analyzing how functions change and what those rates of change are are a pretty important aspect of pre-calculus. Now another really cool thing we could do with rates of change is we can analyze how those rates of change change. Yeah, so we're not only going to look at the rates of change, but we're going to look at how the rates of change change. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but it's actually kind of fun in my world. So first off, rates of change can increase or rates of change can decrease. So function values can go up, but it's how they go up that we might want to analyze, or function values can go down, but it's how they go down that we might want to analyze as well. So again, we're not just looking at what they're going up by, we're looking at the change of how they're going up, or not just looking at how they're going down, but the change of how they're going down. Right, for example, if we take a look at this quadratic function, yet again, we see that the function values are increasing and decreasing, but the change, the rate of change as we move throughout this function is always increasing. The rate of change is always increasing. On the left-hand side, it starts off as very, very negative, and then it continues as we move throughout the function to get negative, but less negative, until we actually make a turning point at that vertex where our rate of change turns into a positive, and then as we continue on throughout the function, it gets more and more and more positive. So what we're doing is analyzing those tangent lines as we go throughout the function to determine the rate of change. And we see that the rates of change are getting bigger the whole time. They're negative, less negative, positive, more positive. So this is what we would call concave up, when our rates of change are increasing the whole time. Here's another two examples of functions that are both concave up. Even though the one on the left is increasing and the one on the right is decreasing, they're both concave up. Because remember, it's not about what the function values are doing. On the left, they're going up. On the right, they're going down. It's what the rates of change of the function values that determines if you're increasing, which means you're concave up. So, on the left-hand side here, we see a function that is, again, increasing. But if we track the rates of change, it starts off rather slow. The change is kind of slow at first. And then it slowly gets more and more and more and more positive. The rate of change is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's increasing rate of change, hence concave up. On the right-hand side, the function is decreasing. But if we track the rates of change as we go throughout the function, the rates of change are also going up. Now hear me out. They're starting out very negative. On the left-hand side of the graph, the rates of change are very negative. As we move throughout the function, the rates of change are getting less and less negative. And when you're getting less and less negative, you're increasing because you're getting closer and closer to zero as you become less and less negative. 
but it doesn't matter, you're definitely going up, so that's why it's still concave up. Now, if you understand the idea of concavity, you can see that both of these graphs are clearly concave up, even though one is going up and one is going down. Now, here we see another function that is increasing, but check out how it's increasing. It's increasing at a decreasing rate. As we move from the left side to the right side, if we look at that slope or that rate of change at any given point, we see that that rate of change is slowly getting smaller. It starts off pretty steep and positive, and then it gets less and less and less and less and less positive. So that's why this is concave down, because the rates of change are going down. Even though the function's increasing the whole time, how it's increasing is decreasing. That's rate of change. That's concave down. And then we see two more graphs here that are both concave down as well. The parabola on the left is both increasing and decreasing, but the rate of change is decreasing the entire time. On the left-hand side, it's pretty positive, and as we move from left to right, it becomes less and less and less and less positive, and then it flips across that vertex and becomes negative, and then more and more and more negative. So it started off really positive, and then it got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it became more and more and more negative, so that's why it's concave down, because the rate of change is going down. Now, on the right-hand side, we see a function that is decreasing. The function values are decreasing, but if we track that rate of change, it starts off kind of negative, and then it slowly gets more and more and more and more negative, and that is why the rate of change is going down, concave down. So the idea here is that we can analyze function values, f of x, y's, outputs, and we could also analyze rates of change. And when we analyze these two different things, we use the same four words, positive, negative, increasing, decreasing. So you've got to make sure when I say positive, what am I talking about? Because I'm talking about function values being positive, I mean that the function is greater than zero above the x-axis. If I talk about rates of change that are positive, I mean that it's increasing through that point. When function values are negative, it means I'm below the x-axis. When rates of change are negative, it means that the function value itself is decreasing. Now, when function values are increasing, it means the graph is moving up from left to right. But when the rate of change is increasing, it means that we're concave up because the rates of change are getting bigger. When our function values are decreasing, it means that our graph is going down from left to right, whereas when our rates of change is decreasing, it means we're concave down because our rates of change are going down. So it's really important that you understand the four words, positive, negative, increasing, decreasing, but you understand them in the proper context of are we talking about function values or are we talking about rates of change. Now, function values you guys should be pretty familiar with. Rates of change I know is kind of a new concept and it's slowly going to get better as we learn more and more. In this first topic of AP Precalculus, we're just trying to introduce you to these terms and understand how they work. So hopefully this was a good introduction for you. It might not be perfect, but hopefully it gives you a, a strong idea of how we're going to talk about change and how we're going to incorporate these words of positive, negative, increasing, and decreasing. All right, that's it for topic 1.1 over change in tandem. Kind of a great introductory topic, but it involves a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of good terms that we're going to use the rest of the year. And if you need more help, I got tons of videos coming over different topics of AP Pre-Calculus, and I already got tons of videos already made, so please make sure you check out playlists that I have in the description below that can link you to many more videos that are going to help you with Pre-Calculus. See you in the next video.